undertaken this work to assist uh, the Mackay Conservation Group in building a case against um, or the next phase of building a case against the Urana Dam. And just as a spoiler, um, it doesn't make sense from an economic perspective. Uh, so that's, if it's too long and you didn't read it, uh, that's, the, that's the bottom line. Um, the benefit cost analysis is flawed in several ways, uh, which I'll reveal in greater detail uh, to you now. Um, this is no conspiracy, it's not fake news. Um, <laughs> We'll see who accepts this uh, particular result, I guess, in the next few months. Um, just about me a little bit. I, as Peter said, I'm a research fellow at Griffith University. I'm also uh, an independent consultant as well. My background is in applied economics, particularly uh, undertaking cost benefit analysis using what are called non-market values. So they are, they are sort of valuations of ecosystem services in particular. So my background is in non-market valuation techniques, uh, particularly as they uh, are applied to uh, ecosystem-based adaptations around the Pacific. I've also completed work on assessing a number of dam proposals across Queensland for the World Wildlife Worldwide Fund for Nature. Um, and I've also done uh, uh, some work on, uh, on as a part of a, a um, a national environmental science program uh, looking at the impacts of uh, particularly nitrogen in Great Barrier Reef waterways and what the economic impacts of that are and how we might use economic tools to help farmers mitigate uh, nitrogen and sediment emissions from their farms. So you're on a dam being in a Great Barrier Reef catchment um, sort of fits very much into my wheelhouse. Um, I've been with Griffith for about five years I think now um, and this is cost benefit analysis non-market valuation is is my speciality um, so without further ado I'll dive into the presentation I'm assuming and I'll wait for a nod from Peter I'm assuming you're you're all across the proposal for a large water impoundment uh, in this particular region um, there's uh, a preliminary business case uh, put together by a group. Let me just move there. Uh, oh, sorry, I'll rewind that and I'll go back just to, I guess, to the structure of my uh, presentation. First of all, I'm going to give you a bit of a background on, this is just a bit of a primer to make sure that you're aware of the policy space in which new water impoundments are operating in both Queensland and across Australia. I'll also outline a little bit what a cost benefit analysis is. You're probably all familiar with the terms, but some of the detail I'm going to dive into tonight might be, uh, might be a little bit new to you. So I'm going to go across a very simple example to demonstrate how I've come up uh, with a few challenges to those assumptions in the business case. Um, business cases are built on an element of assumption around what uh, are costs and what's the benefits. I'll talk you through where the flaws are in the current preliminary business case. Uh, there's about six or seven, I think, flaws, uh, major flaws um, in this business case. And I've inserted those into a, like a reassessment of a cost benefit analysis. So taking the original figures, adding some new figures uh, and then coming up with a reassessment from a cost benefit perspective. I'll also then quickly outline uh, a sort of few further risks, um, broader risks really with new water impoundments um, in this age, and then finish off with just a couple, two very key messages that I think you can all take away. Uh, if you get asked about it, you'll be able to understand how these are very important, very simple messages. So some background, I'm working from what's called a preliminary business case, uh, which through the rest of this presentation, I'll call the PBC, uh, put together by a consortium. These are the proponents, uh, which is the Bowen and Collinsville Enterprises Inc. Um, I won't go into the politics and the gossip too much as to who's behind it. Um, uh, Peter, I'm sure can fill you in on that. Uh, this preliminary business case contains what's called an economic assessment, which is using a cost or benefit cost analysis. 
Uh, it's a pretty standard tool in economic analysis. I'll go through in a bit more detail uh, very shortly. The preliminary business case looked at three different options for a, an, an empowerment at Urana Creek. Only one of them, the largest of those impoundments, uh, had a positive return on investment. Um, so any one of them seemed to make sense from the proponent's perspective. This is a larger one that enabled about 11,000 hectares of irrigated agriculture, new irrigated agriculture around the, the area of Collinsville. That one apparently did have a return on investment or a, a positive benefit cost ratio. Um, however, it was built on flawed assumptions and a misapplication of the benefit cost process. The two smaller options that didn't have agriculture uh, associated with it um, didn't pass muster uh, even at this particular stage. The, so it seems like the agriculture has kind of been tacked on to really what was a business case presented to ensure there's a flow of, of water southwards to, uh, to Murrumbar and possibly onto the Galilee Basin. Some background as to how water policy for new empowerments work uh, in Australia. The, the Council of Australian Governments agreed back in, way back in 1994 that new water empowerments must achieve full cost recovery from the users. So they're not to be built from a sort of a nation building perspective or as a form of, of uh, regional development. The users of that water must be able to pay back the costs, the, opera, the, the capital costs, uh, and fulfill maintenance costs uh, going forward from the sale of that water. Most of the new regional dams, of course, have been for agricultural uh, purposes, uh, and the cost recovery has not really been a reality. So the operator, owner and operator of most regional dams in Queensland, Sunwater, which is a, a fully state government owned corporation, is today subsidized by the Queensland government through a community service obligation payment. So full cost recovery is not yet a reality across uh, Queensland. Yes. Sorry, um, do you have a screen you need to share at the moment? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. so sorry. There we go. Um, much, much easier to understand. <laughs> uh, can you see that now? You can follow me. Could you see my screen? Not yet. You are sharing a screen. We, we can see if it's not occupied in full screen, you can, uh, if you want, you can make it bigger. Okay, how about that? Yep, that's correct. That's perfect. Thank you. Awesome. Very sorry about that. Thanks for reminding me, Peter. Um, so, uh, sorry, just to reiterate. So, as yet, uh, there's very uh, few cases where full cost recovery from water users is actually a reality across Queensland. And it's long been recognised by governments that they're simply not charging enough for the water uh, out of these empowerments. But much of that is being driven, uh, of course, by um, the fact that they can't charge uh, exactly what they want because there's no users of that water of the ch of the of the price that they're asking for it. The theory behind it is probably quite sound. It would mean that if we are building impoundments, uh, they do make an eco economic sense, and the water would flow to the highest value users. So we wouldn't be necessarily growing sugarcane out of uh, large impoundments, but we'd be growing higher value crops, perhaps cotton. Uh, perhaps soft fruits and fruit trees, those kind of things. So the idea behind full cost recovery and water trading is possibly sound, um, but at the moment, uh, the, this is not a reality um, across Queensland. A benefit cost uh, analysis, I think we probably instinctively know what a benefit cost uh, analysis is, um, but just uh, for those that don't, or just to provide a bit of extra detail uh, around uh, the work that's uh, gone behind this particular report. It estimates the benefits minus the costs, i.e. the net benefits of undertaking a project when compared to a base case. So in some instances, a base case is sometimes called a business as usual case, which is probably a, another fair reflection uh, of it. It's not necessarily a do nothing. So a base case is not 
do nothing, uh, as in uh, leaving it to the market, for example, might also be uh, a good assessment against which you're measuring a project. Uh, but importantly, the net benefits are measured against that base case. Uh, the cost benefit analysis looks at a number of costs and benefits, and it's a funny word, homogenize those into economic values so they can be uh, directly compared with one another. But importantly, what a cost benefit analysis does, it considers the timing of those. At what point in the future are those costs and benefits incurred? As this is incredibly important when it comes to uh, considering, uh, I guess, from a decision making perspective, what the value of those costs and benefits in the future are. So we call this uh, in the economics world discounting, um, but as, I guess a simple way to think about it is from a personal perspective, would you like $100 now or would you like $100 next year, for example? Now, most people want to choose that $100 now, today. Uh, however, if I asked you maybe you want $150 in a year's time, maybe I might get some takers for that $150. So that's you implicitly applying a discount rate to that future value of $150. I, it's at, or that $100 uh, today, you'd need $150 to make up for that lack of money today. So it's how you think how people feel about the future value of, uh, of costs and benefits. Now it's related to some extent to the risk associated with a project. So high risk projects uh, from a decision making perspective, you might apply a very high discount rate, i.e. you think there's not much possibility of getting a return on investment from this because of uh, climate change, COVID, you name it, there might be a number of reasons why you might apply a high discount rate. But it's also related to what we call the long run return on investment. So if you were to simply put that money in the bank, uh, what interest rate would you earn over the years for it? So your project needs to be better than simply putting that money in a bank and earning long-term uh, rates of interest uh, on it. So in cost-benefit analysis, we apply, uh, or we use the terms future value and present value. Uh, future value is what it actually costs in the future. The present value is how much we consider that future value to be in present value terms. So I've, I've just just to, I've just created, a, I guess, a very simple uh, cost benefit analysis for you. Um, let me just bring it onto the screen. Why can't I bring it onto the screen? And this will show you uh, very simply how we might um, just one moment. Okay. So can you see a, a very simple spreadsheet in front of you? Uh, so a thumbs up if you can see a spreadsheet from someone. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so this is a very simple example of a cost benefit analysis to show you the importance of when we consider costs uh, and how it impacts our decision making from today. So on the first column, you'll see uh, a series of years. So these are years after the project has been implemented. Uh, the first two red columns are uh, our costs associated with the project. Uh, our costs are in two columns. First, we have the future value, which is the real cost. And the second column there is what's called the present value, i.e. how we think about that cost from today's perspective by applying uh, a 7% discount rate, which is essentially what Queensland government and the Australian government uh, request of project proponents. So in this particular instance, you can see there's a big uh, cost there in year one, and then a smaller flow of benefit of costs, uh, perhaps in maintenance costs, I suppose, over the years through to year 10. Now the green columns are exactly the same, but these are monetized benefits. 
Um, so you can see the benefits that flow. So this might be, say, from agriculture or recreation, for example. They're building up over the course of a year before, over five years before they reach their maximum level of benefit, $500 a year. Uh, the next column there is that value in present value terms, how we think about that future value from today's perspective. That last column there is the net of those. So that's the benefits minus the costs. And so this is, I guess, a, a good example, say, of a, a, a cost benefit analysis of a dam. You've got some very high costs in the year, in the first year, that might be the capital expenditure to build the dam. Um, and then there's maintenance costs every year uh, for the consideration, for the 10 year consideration. So you can see in this instance, the real value, the future value of this particular project comes out at $3,175, random number. And you can see the future benefits come out at $4,000, seemingly a greater value. So from a very simple perspective, this project would seemingly make sense. You would have a, a net benefit of around $800 or $825, for example. However, when we apply discount rate, so this includes our perspectives around risk or alternative uh, options for investment, you'll see that our present value costs are actually greater than our present value benefits. And so overall, when we're considering this project from a cost benefit perspective, it actually doesn't make sense. We end up with uh, present value costs being greater than present value benefits. Therefore, it would return, this is the ratio of benefits to costs of less than one, i.e. for every dollar spent, we get $0.94 back. So it doesn't make economic sense uh, from using a cost benefit as a tool. And yet, from a very simple perspective, our costs are seemingly less than our benefits. Um, and that's because uh, you can see there the erosion of that present value uh, over the years. And it's the same with our present, uh, with our costs as well. You can see those eroding over these years. So this is a, a good example of how I'm looking at the Urana Creek Dam. We've got a lot of upfront costs and benefits that also flow uh, from that Urana Dam. However, where I come in is I was looking at these columns, particularly around uh, the costs of those dam, of that dam, and where perhaps there are additional hidden costs that weren't necessarily considered by the proponents. So I'm just going to go back to my uh, presentation. Let me just check. So there's two key metrics, uh, therefore, for our benefit cost uh, analysis. One is that ratio of benefits to costs, i.e. the benefit cost ratio. If it's greater than one, it makes economic sense. If it's less than one, it doesn't make economic sense. Another metric we uh, might look at is the net, I've spelled that wrongly, it's the net present value, NPV, uh, which is the present value benefits, so all of the benefits added up, minus the costs. And if that's a positive number, it makes economic sense to pursue the project. If it's a negative number, it makes no economic sense to pursue this particular project. Importantly, with a cost benefit analysis, I've, I showed you a very simple example where I've just totaled the costs and totaled the benefits. This is what we call the scope of a benefit cost analysis. So one can imagine uh, with an extremely complex project, such as the construction of a dam, there's a number of costs that are associated with it. So not just one overall uh, construction cost, but there might be maintenance costs, there might be social and environmental costs uh, to construction of that dam. And it's the same with the benefits. It might not just be beneficial to sell the water, but there might also be recreational benefits that come from building that dam. So the scope of a benefit cost analysis is very important. It has, actually has really significant bearing on what the output metrics of a benefit cost analysis might be. Now, in some instances, 
what is included in the scope of a benefit cost analysis is driven by the availability of the data. So in some really easy data points, like, you know, how much is concrete and therefore how much does the dam cost to build? But then there are other areas where there's very little data available. Perhaps um, what is the value of the biodiversity uh, in, in that's being destroyed, being taken away in pursuing this project, uh, even measuring um, what the recreational value to a dam might be is there's not many data points around that either. So in other, some instances is driven by lack of data, but in other instances is also what might be appropriate to monetize. So uh, for example, ecosystem service values, such as maybe climate regulation, i.e. the carbon sequestration value of the, of the, of the forest, on which the impoundment will remove. That can be fairly easy monetized. We can value the carbon in the trees uh, by sort of getting some data on, you know, how much tons per hectare of average uh, bushland forest might be and multiplying it, say, by the social cost of carbon. Then we can come up with a fairly simple metric for the value of carbon that's released when building this dam. Other social uh, uh, values, such as cultural and spiritual values, they can also be economically valued. And I'll show you an example of that later. Um, but they might not necessarily be appropriate to value. And so therefore, instead of considering it in a cost benefit analysis, we might look at that from a, a, a multi-criteria perspective. Um, what are the loss of cultural and spiritual values uh, that are caused by um, the building of this impoundment? So although maybe we can economically value them, and we do that for very good reasons, for example, if we don't do it, quite often the cultural and spiritual values are simply dismissed of having no value. Um, however, we need to be sensitive to uh, uh, local land managers as to how we might do that and whether we do that in the first place. But fundamentally, analysts shouldn't deliberately attempt to game the scope of a cost benefit analysis to mislead decision makers. Um, in this instance, uh, it's a business case put forward by um, a, a local enterprise group. They're trying to put a positive spin on it. Um, they're not necessarily deliberately misleading it. It's a pretty detailed report. However, there are large gaps that they've chosen uh, not to consider as a cost of building this dam uh, that are eminently uh, includable. I mean, it, 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 we've got lots of data points for the inclusion, so that's not necessarily an excuse. Um, so it's not really a convenience thing. Uh, they've merely chosen to um, just not put them in, to ignore them. Uh, um, and building Queensland, who uh, have uh, templates for undertaking uh, benefit cost analysis, as some pretty specific requirements for what, what's admissible in a, in a benefit cost analysis. And that's about materiality and relevance, not convenience or, or political spin. This is a, some of you might have come across what we call the total economic value framework. So this is to sort of expand that scope into some real life examples. Total economic value is a way of considering the full scope of values that might be lost when pursuing a project. There's some pretty obvious examples, uh, particularly direct use values, that are pretty easy, to, uh, pretty easy to include in cost benefit analysis. That might be how much you get for your water or how much additional agriculture you get, uh, or what the recreational values that might, be, uh, uh, might come about through the construction of a dam. However, in many instances, this is sort of where business cases finish because this is essentially, if you just include what are called direct use values, that's things that are consumed directly uh, by societies and economies, that's gen these are obviously marketable goods. These fetch a price in the market, so they're very easy to value. Uh, there's lots of data that can support uh, your business case using direct use values, but it's actually only a very small component of the total economic value of what might be lost when pursuing this project. So I've taken the liberty of including some of what are called indirect use values, such as the carbon value that might be lost when pursuing this project, 
the consequences on water quality for Great Barrier Reef uh, Marine Park might be. Um, I've also quant qualitatively, I guess, touched on some non-use values. So these are often those cultural and spiritual values that might be lost when pursuing this particular project. So taking a total economic value uh, view of a cost benefit analysis, you can see how it broadens the scope away from just those direct use marketable values, things that fetch a price in a market. So there are six key areas that uh, I looked at to challenge the assumptions and the scope of the proponent's cost benefit analysis. Uh, in many instances, um, the values were ignored because it doesn't necessarily uh, give a good picture of the particular project. In this first instance, uh, point number one on this slide, um, this was how they calculated the base case. So that was the business as usual case. There was a big sleight of hand uh, here by the proponents. Um, $700 million worth of sleight of hand, if I remember, if the figures are coming soon. So it's, a, it's sort of one of those cup shuffles where you have a marble under a cup and you're moving it around quick enough and someone gets totally lost and all of a sudden a business case makes sense uh, because they've, uh, you know, they've, they've pulled a fast one on you and they've included something, a major component that shouldn't actually have been uh, included. And that's the, a, a pipeline that, uh, well, it's actually a duplication of a pipeline that doesn't actually uh, exist at the moment. Um, and that's from Burdekin Falls Dam down to Murrumbah. This was their base case, the assumption that this pipeline needs to be built or is being built and it's simply not being built. There's no current project for it. Other things in their cost benefit analysis that are open to challenge are the way they calculated the agricultural benefits. So that's the crop mix that will be grown on this, uh, the 11,000 hectares of irrigation development around Collinsville. They also didn't include their biodiversity offsets that will be required under legislation. They didn't include the costs of mitigating agricultural pollution into the Great Barrier Reef. They didn't include carbon emissions and they potentially could have valued and included cultural and spiritual values that would be lost through the construction of this dam. So to take each of those six points into a bit more detail, uh, and this was, uh, this was the major sleight of hand in uh, this particular business case, it's, uh, it sort of gives them a head start really in calculating all of their benefits that you get um, from a particular project. So they assumed that the do nothing, the business as usual case would demand the construction of a pipeline from Burdekin Falls Dam down to Murrumbah um, to presumably uh, help make clean coal by washing it, by adding water. Is that how you make clean coal? I'm not sure. Um, their business, their, so their base case included the costs of this. Now the costs were uh, nearly $600 million in capital expenditure and around $104 million in operational expenditure. Uh, so in a sense, before they even considered the three options um, for, for uh, the, the, the dam at Urana, they were given a, a like a $702 million head start on their benefit cost analysis. So without doing anything, without calculating any further benefits, they're already starting at nearly three quarters of a billion dollars. And this is what's called an avoided cost. So in cost benefit analysis, it's not unusual to include an avoided cost as a benefit, but in this instance, uh, it was an erroneous um, uh, uh, application of the benefit cost method. So to give you a bit of a visual um, of the way I broke this down so that you can see there on the left panel there is the base case. So the base case, if Urana Dam is not built, it will mean that there will be a duplication of 
a pipeline from Burdekin Falls Dam to, Mara, to the Murrumbah coal field, about three quarters of a billion dollars over the next 30 years. So the way the proponent approached their business case was, if we don't build the Burdekin, if we build Urana, we won't have to build the Burdekin Falls Dam uh, pipeline. So we can include the avoided costs of that dam in our business case. And as you can see from Urana Dam there in the middle, there are also various pipelines off to Peter Faust Dam to the irrigation scheme around Collinsville. But also if we obviously if we don't build the Burdekin Falls Dam, we obviously need to uh, pump the water to the Murrumbah coal field from the Urana Dam. Now for me, that's, and the Queensland government agreed, that was a misdiagnosis of what the base case was. So in my revised assumptions, which is in that panel on the right hand side, uh, I've taken the Burdekin Falls Dam pipeline out of the equation completely, uh, which overall changes the benefit cost analysis by a mere $702 million over a 30 year period. This is there's a little bit of detail in here. Um, this is about operational costs only, and it shows you, I guess, a bit more detail around how the sleight of hand has occurred. So the base case there, uh, just from an operational perspective, um, means that the avoided cost from an operational perspective was about $240 million in the negative. The way they structured their uh, their three options was to avoid building and operating this dam. But of course you have the other expenditure for uh, the other pipelines as well. But that gave them, I thought this was very cheeky. It gave them an operational balance of, of positive $104, uh, $104 million rather, um, as an avoided cost uh, of not building this pipeline, just for an operational perspective. Now, again, the third panel here is my revised, uh, I guess, schematic on how I considered it. And that looks at the operational costs of the additional pipelines from Urana purely as a cost. So there's no benefits to uh, the operation of these pipelines um, other than the cost of their make. There's no, there's no net benefit from uh, the operation of these pipelines uh, when we take the Burdekin Falls Dam out of the equation. So the preliminary business case was, has been uh, lightly reviewed by the Department of Natural Resources, Mines and Energy. Uh, and they were pretty scathing uh, around the inclusion of the avoided costs of the Burdekin Murrumbah pipeline. Uh, there's currently no proposal uh, for it. There's no uh, detailed costings for it. Uh, there's no promises uh, for it. So to include it in an economic assessment of the Urana Dam was an erroneous application of the benefit cost analysis method. So another uh, major assumption that I challenged was the projected uh, crop mix. Um, the option three, the larger of the impoundments included agricultural benefits from the, the, the construction of about 11,000 hectares of agricultural development around Collinsville. Their business case included benefits flowing some, for some pretty high value crops, uh, mainly cotton, sorghum and, and soft vegetables. Um, these were uh, again criticized by the Department of Natural Resources, Mines and Energy of being fairly heroic assumptions uh, built around what the likely crop mix would be in this particular area. Um, the proponents have done a fair bit of work around rainfall, topography and soil types and, a, and what was included in the business case is certainly possible. Um, however, there hasn't been a large impoundment built in Queensland, in North Queensland for a while that hasn't simply uh, resorted to uh, the lower margin crop uh, that's, that's sugar cane, um, whether it's the Burdekin, lower Burdekin uh, irrigation scheme is the major one that um, is in that part of the world. 
that's almost purely uh, turned over to sugarcane, which earns less money. Uh, and therefore, the growers can't afford to actually pay this, the, what they were predicting in the business case for that particular water. So I challenged it based on what that crop mix might be. And there was a couple of studies um, done by uh, economics colleagues over the years that have recalculated margins based on reduced uh, benefits flowing from uh, agriculture. A third one buried in one of the pages in the preliminary business case was an admission uh, that they would need to spend approximately $15 million on biodiversity offsets through the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. Um, I don't know the particular area, but there's habitat of concern uh, in this particular area. Uh, 30 threatened species listed under the act that would require significant biodiversity offsets, $15 million worth. I brought that into my reassessment of the benefit cost analysis. Fourthly, this was uh, a major one, um, agricultural runoff uh, from, uh, particularly from sugarcane farms in North Queensland has uh, impacted water quality of catchments flowing into the Great Barrier Reef uh, Marine Park. Two particular pollutants of concern are dissolved inorganic nitrogen, that's DIN um, on that slide there. Dissolved inorganic nitrogen is a result of over application of fertilizer. So this is application of a nitrogen phosphorus based fertilizer, over apply it and it's not taken up by the plant. Uh, it simply drains into the soil and into waterways um, causing a significant impact on water quality in those waterways and into the Great Barrier Reef. Lots of nutrients in the water creates all of that turbidity and, and crown of thorns uh, starfish outbreaks. Uh, and also loss of ground cover um, encourages sediment to also flow into those waterways, particularly in the Burdekin uh, River that uh, suffers from sort of almost running dry to, to major, major floods and the export of, of significant amounts of, uh, of sediment. The Queensland and Australian governments have agreed to the Reef 2050 Water Quality Improvement uh, Plan that sets out uh, by 2050 a 60% reduction in DIN exports uh, and a 30% uh, decrease in sediment exports for the Burdekin River. Um, the, some of you might know, um, but there's been, or last, earlier this year, the Queensland government uh, pass new regulations on um, on it to try and improve water quality in Great Barrier Reef catchments. And as part of the regulatory impact statement, uh, they actually calculated some fairly detailed costs on what each additional hectare of agriculture in Great Barrier Reef catchments, how much it would cost to mitigate the additional pollutants uh, from new agriculture. So we have some pretty good pretty robust figures around what each new hectare of agricultural production in a Great Barrier Reef catchment uh, might look like. Those reef, the, the reef regulations haven't uh, kicked in yet. They've been put on ice um, thanks to COVID, but the 2040, 2050 water quality improvement targets are, are, are still active. So any new agriculture in Great Barrier Reef catchments needs to consider the costs of mitigating these pollutants. So again, I've included those in the benefit cost analysis uh, reassessment. Only a couple more of these, carbon emissions. When you inundate a forest, of course, uh, the trees slowly die and release carbon into the atmosphere, adding to uh, Australia's um, emissions inventory each year. Although the proponent has no legal liability uh, for carbon emissions, as we have no uh, I mean, I guess we do have an emissions policy just about uh, in Australia, um, which is the, the safeguards policy that keeps getting abused. But in with the lack of, a, of, an, of an emissions policy, uh, the proponent has no legal liability um, for these emissions. However, when we're looking at cost benefit analysis and using that total economic value framework, we take a a social or a whole of society perspective to considering those costs and benefits, 
we can include those emissions uh, in our assessment. And we should, it, they're material uh, and we have data uh, for them. Uh, Australian accounting rules state that when you flood something or when you cut down a tree, uh, that carbon is lost immediately. That's not necessarily the case with a dam. Um, there's, I, I, there's pretty complicated science around it in the sense that sometimes if you flood a valley, those trees are actually creating methane, which is a more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide anyway. However, the rules state that you've got to account for it in year one. So I've also included carbon emissions uh, in our benefit cost uh, analysis reassessment. So uh, the last, uh, I guess, challenge on the assumptions here is cultural and spiritual values. They can be economically valued and we've got some economic tools uh, in our toolbox called data preference techniques that enable us to elicit what are called non-use values. I, that's these ones over here, there's vicarious values, existence values, bequest values, these are non-marketed, non-traded values that we might have. There are some pretty good examples in the academic literature of values of um, ecosystems and, and habitat from a cultural and spiritual perspective. Probably the most relevant there is one uh, by Xander and Stratton that estimated that improvements in the quality of water holes was worth about a one-off uh, gain of about $300 to each individual Aboriginal person. They also calculated it was about, worth about $60 for non-Aboriginal people. Um, so it demonstrates that you can put economic values on things such as water holes or water courses. Um, these are economic values that are so they're not traded in markets, they're not exchange values, um, but it's an economic assessment of how much you would gain if they were improved or perhaps how much you would lose if you were lost. In this instance, um, with discussions with Peter, we decided not to include economic values of cultural and spiritual values. Um, they need to be very highly specific. And in this instance, uh, it would require a significant amount of work to go and undertake uh, uh, research to go and get that data um, from the uh, traditional owners uh, in, in that part of the world. Um, it's, it's important that they're not dismissed and considered in, in other ways, um, but perhaps if this project uh, gets a, a tick in the preliminary or in the detailed feasibility study, uh, maybe some uh, more work around the cultural and spiritual values, particularly for Aboriginal people uh, of this particular area, might be a piece of work worth pursuing, um, and particularly to try and get economic values of those. However, we, we need also to consider that it might be simply inappropriate to uh, elicit economic values for cultural and spiritual values. So, but in this instance, they, they haven't been considered, but they're, they're flagged in, in, in the report Peter might share with you as something that we can't, we can't let it fall off the radar in this instance going forward. Um, so putting all of those uh, together in a sort of a reassessed cost benefit analysis. I've, I've run it a f uh, five times. I've created five scenarios um, to just, I guess, give you some confidence where if some of these are challenged and everything in a cost benefit analysis can be challenged. Uh, but I've given you a number of different scenarios in which to uh, give you confidence that if this particular aspect is argued over, then you can fall back to actually say, well, if we just include this, this, and this, actually it still doesn't make economic sense. So this first scenario is actually just based on uh, the Queensland government uh, assessment of the application of the benefit cost analysis that took out the avoided costs of the Burdick and Murrumbah pipeline. So this was that sleight of hand I was talking about earlier. They assume that it needs to be built and therefore they can add $702 million as a benefit 
to uh, to building the Murrumbah, to, to building the Urana Dam. So if we just simply take that out of the equation um, and not include any of the additional uh, social and environmental costs, this dam option three, the large impoundment that had the benefits of the sale of water to uh, the coal fields and the sale of water to irrigators uh, had a, a, a benefit cost ratio of just 0.54. So every dollar investment, uh, you just get 54 cents back. Um, so it doesn't make economic sense uh, to build this dam, even using the proponent's own figures. Uh, you can see on that right-hand column there, just for your information, I've got the total costs and total benefits. These are, uh, these are the discounted benefits. And you can see it actually, this pursuing this project would actually come at a cost, uh, a, a social cost of about $600 million over a 30 year period. When we start including uh, some of those external environmental costs, such as uh, mitigating emissions into the Great Barrier Reef catchment, the biodiversity offsets and carbon emissions, uh, you can see the benefit cost ratio falls even further, 0.49 in this instance. So the business case is getting worse when we add those external costs onto that revised business case. So again, uh, a pretty dim picture of uh, the benefits that would accrue from this dam. A third scenario I looked at was um, taking account of uh, a reduced water price. So this is assuming that uh, particularly the agricultural producers wouldn't be paying the, the, the dollar per megaliter assumptions in the base in the preliminary business case. If we assumed a lower water price than what the business case is presenting, and included our uh, external costs. Again, this project is still not making sense. 70 cent, 77 cents return for every dollar you spent. Uh, another scenario, which um, this, this time looking at reduced agricultural margins. So we can't look at reduced water price and reduced agricultural margins together as they are kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, however, it's, uh, these are using, this is using data from um, a, a colleague, uh, another economics colleague here in Brisbane, and actually generally how much of, uh, uh, what has been the benefit from past agricultural developments in this particular area that have generally started out with best of intentions of growing high value agricultural products but have actually defaulted back to sugarcane growing, uh, say such as, as the Burdekin Falls Dam. Now, if we reduce the agricultural benefits that would flow from uh, the pursuit of this dam and included uh, those external costs, again, we've got a, 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 a poor return on investment there. Uh, perhaps the, the sort of the worst scenario, and you can see the numbers here on the right are getting quite significant. Uh, now we're up to a sort of a, a negative a billion dollars in, in terms of pursuing this dam. And that's when we use, uh, we add in that revised business case. So we, so we remove the assumptions of the avoided cost of this pipeline. We include our uh, external costs, social and ex social environmental external costs and we consider reduced agricultural margins, which has been the norm in this part of the world. So this is this scenario is is kind of really the the worst case uh, scenario. Um, it's still eminently feasible. I mean, all of the external costs are very robust. The revised business case uh, it needs to be included in this. So this is probably a headline figure uh, moving forward. And it's like the, I guess a key takeaway message is that pursuit of the Urana Creek Dam uh, has a, a net present value of, of minus a billion dollars over a 30 year period uh, with, a, with a return on investment of, of about 0.26. So 26 cents return for every dollar that's spent on construction maintenance of this dam. 
there's just to, I guess, touch on a few sort of satellite issues associated with the construction of this dam. There's been some what are called ex post or sort of after the fact benefit cost assessments of uh, some dams in North Queensland, uh, again by a colleague, Jim Binney, uh, here in Brisbane. Now he's reassessed Burdick and Dam Falls around about 15 years, I think, uh, after 15 years of operation. Uh, he's recalculated the figures and after a business case suggested there would be a return on investment from Burdick and Falls Dam, it's actually provided a benefit cost ratio after the fact of about 0.65. And he's done the same for Paradise Dam, um, which is a bit further south, and that's had a benefit cost ratio of about 0.4. A lot of that is based on how much agricultural uh, growers are willing to pay for water uh, to grow default back to lower value crops uh, over the years. So lessons from the past have suggested major impoundments haven't necessarily achieved that stated policy goal of, um, of covering the costs of maintenance and construction of new impoundments. Obviously, climate change uh, generates uh, significant uncertainty on dam yields as well. Um, there's a sort of growing amount of literature on sort of what long-term changes in rainfall might be. Of course, downscaling that to particular catchments is exceptionally difficult. However, one way to include this would maybe to consider higher discount rates, i.e. there's greater uncertainty um, when considering whether to build this dam or not. But also across Queensland generally, but also in, in the, uh, that, that central Queensland region, uh, there's, there's existing underutilization of water resources uh, already. So policy uh, in Queensland and in the Australian government around new infrastructure, the first things that should be considered are, are we using existing infrastructure as effectively and as efficiently as we can? Um, if we are, then we can, can perhaps consider different, you know, how we might do things better uh, with the existing resources. And then we might consider construction of new, new assets uh, once we've uh, sort of exhausted existing options. But at the moment, we're not actually utilizing existing water options particularly effectively anyway. So the two key messages um, uh, from an economic perspective, and I have to say benefit cost ratio just takes an economic perspective, it doesn't provide the answer. It's just an answer from an economic perspective. Uh, there might be other reasons why you might pursue a project, um, but from an economic perspective, and economics tends to drive policy uh, these days, from an economic perspective, the construction of the Urana Dam should not be supported. It comes at a net social cost to the community. It's going to cost the community to pursue this particular project. But also from a policy perspective, um, i.e. we have this policy of uh, the users of water should be paying for new assets and the maintenance of those assets. From a policy perspective, again, it doesn't uh, make policy sense. It's against current policy of Queensland and Australian governments. Um, so it's not likely to achieve the stated goals of cost recovery from those water users. So there's a lot of work to be done by the proponent in putting together a stronger uh, feasibility study, a detailed feasibility study. I suspect they will have to remove their assumptions around the Murrumbah or Burdick and Murrumbah pipeline However, they will also then likely, they'll need to sort of somehow find an extra $700 million of benefit to make up for the loss of that. And I suspect they will work fairly hard to try and uh, achieve that perhaps through expanding their, uh, the benefits that flow, particularly from agriculture, but also the price of water, perhaps from um, the southbound pipeline to Murrumbah and although it's not stated in the preliminary business case, I think it's widely accepted that pipelines might head a little bit further south and west uh, into New Galilee coal developments as well. So maybe that might also be part of the feas detailed feasibility study. Um, 
not part of this study that I looked at. It's not even mentioned, but I suspect that's where they'll try to bolster their benefit cost analysis or their economic analysis uh, moving forward. So I think um, for Mackay Conservation Group, you've got some good ammunition here based on the preliminary business case, but I suspect they'll come back with some new figures for the feasibility study um, that you'll need to take then a careful look at again to just to challenge some of those assumptions. I think they'll get booted out on, on, on the pipeline, avoided cost, um, but I'm sure they'll bolster some other figures in there as well. So um, vigilance, I think, is uh, the watchword um, for you. So, uh, yeah, that's the end of what I have to say. Uh, there's a, a detailed report that maybe Peter might share um, with you. Um, you're willing, you're quite open, you know, um, uh, it, please use it in any way that you see fit. Um, and good luck with your work going forward. Thanks uh, very much, Andrew. Um, you can stop sharing your screen. And I'm more than willing to answer uh, any questions. Um, you can just stop, stop sharing your screen uh, now. We, we oh, yeah. can't see everyone in the room. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, so is there anyone uh, either online or in the room who would like to ask Andrew a question? I'd just like to sort of make a comment that I think that was a really clear presentation. Uh, that it, 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 like economics and uh, accounting and uh, any of that sort of stuff tends to, um, you know, muddle my brain. Uh, so I, I, I clearly understood what was going on with that on the paper everyone else did. Um, and, you know, clearly it, it shows that, you know, you can you can make a small fortune out of dams by starting off with a big one. And uh, that's, that's what's probably going to happen in this case. So, um, yeah, so anyone, uh, does anyone have a question that they'd like to ask? Go ahead, just sit and take yourself off mute and ask the question. Here we go, please. Um, Andrew, can you uh, give an indication of uh, uh, accounting for depreciation in terms of inflation? in relation to those costs. We're not suffering any inflation now, uh, so to speak, and probably won't for the next five years. But uh, would that not normally be discounted even further and make less of a business case? Um, I, I, it, yes, <laughs> typical economist answer, yes and no. Firstly, a rate of inflation was, was no doubt implied in their uh, in their costs column. So they would have looked at uh, costs over the years, perhaps of maintenance and repairs and things like that. They would have inflated that price uh, in it. However, their cost benefit analysis is a, is, is a black box. I kind of see what comes out of it. I don't actually see what they've calculated inside it. However, if I was undertaking it, I would have included inflation and costs inside my, my costs column but also to an extent, the application of a discount rate also uh, enables us to account for inflation uh, over those years. So the discount rate sort of either ramps up or ramps down the uncertainty inherent in the figures. So the, a discount rate of 7% a year is, look, it, it, it's two ways of looking at it. it. I think it's quite high in a low inflation world or in a, in a world where we're probably looking at um, interest rates in particular as not being much above zero for many years ahead. However, a 7% rate is, is still quite a high rate that perhaps in, it builds in um, particularly uncertainties around uh, the margins on agricultural products, um, things like climate change and, and the yields that the dam is able to provide and things like that. So. Inflation is implied in it, if not necessarily explicit in it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew. Um, well, Andrew's been speaking nonstop for more than an hour now. So, um, you know, I think that uh, there are probably a lot of questions, but if you wanted to send them to me, uh, Peter at conservation.org.au, and maybe Ashley can type that into the chat, that's my email address. Um, 
I can I can see whether Andrew can answer any further questions you may have. We've also recorded this uh, presentation, so we'll put that on our YouTube and send you a link to that, so you can look at it again. Uh, and I'll sort of see whether Andrew can share his PowerPoint presentation with us, uh, maybe. Um, but we'll also make that uh, report that Andrew has yep. prepared for us available very soon. Um, yeah, well, uh, thanks Andrew for showing up and thanks everyone else for turning up to this meeting. We'd also, we're, we're about to embark on our, our annual general meeting, so um, that'll only take maybe 20 minutes or so. Uh, if you would, if people could just hang around for that, that would be very helpful for us to have a quorum and elect a, a, a new um, committee. But I uh, just want to say again, Andrew, thanks very much for all the work you've done. Uh, and you know, it's really robust and, and I think it is going to be really extremely beneficial for our campaign work around the Urana Dam. Sorry, is someone gives a hand up? Oh, Jonathan, I think you're on mute. Can you hear me now? No. Yes. Okay, um, my, well, my question would be this report, how are you going to get this report out beyond, you know, MCG and, and you know, the okay. conservation? How do we get this into yeah. government or oppositional hands? Yeah, well, well, well um, that's something we can answer, I think, more than Andrew, but um, we'll be uh, presenting that to the media uh, in the coming few days. Uh, talk, you know, sending a copy to the uh, Coordinator General as well, who's doing, uh, is currently preparing the draft terms of reference for the um, Urana Dam project, and uh, to the Federal Environment Department, who are also, you know, uh, major decision makers in this process, and anyone else in those government departments, you know, state development, uh, uh, natural resources, mines and energy, etc., uh, and speaking with the key uh, decision makers in each of those departments. So. So there'll be a lot of work done around this uh, and um, the Climate Conservation Group is also uh, in the process of, of employing a campaign worker um, to, to help us with that, that work to get the, um, the word out about, about Urana and about the, the other dams that are being proposed for the Vertican Basin. So I'll, I'd just like to end that, this session now and just again say thanks to Andrew. So thank you, Andrew, for coming along. Uh, well, thank you for being such attentive listeners in some pretty dry, uh, pretty dry content. It's been a pleasure talking to you and um, stay in touch, Peter. Thank you, Andrew. Bye-bye. Bye. Yes, um, I'd just like to say on behalf of the Whit Sunday Conservation Council, thank you very much to Mackay Conservation Group for organising this and for spearheading this campaign. And if there's anything we can do to help you, just give us a call. Thank you. That'll be funny, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs>